Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining another uh, session of EMI Live, an initiative from the Cleveland Clinic Endocrinology and Metabolic Institute to engage with uh, community and academic endocrinologists from all over the nation with interesting cases and world-renowned speakers. Uh, our uh, topic for conversation today is diabetes. We are going to start with a case. Uh, Dr. Michelle Lundholm, one of our first year clinical fellows, will be presenting the case. We have our two panelists, Dr. Marwan Hamari, who is a staff endocrinologist uh, and saw the patient. And then we have uh, Diana Isaacs, pharmacist and co-director of the uh, Cleveland Clinic EMI Endocrinology and Pregnancy Center of Excellence. Dr. Lundholm. Thank you. So good morning all and welcome to those in internal medicine and family medicine who are joining us today. So I'm going to lead us off with a case on the topic of diabetes technology, specifically the use of CGM and closed loop pump in a type 1 a diabetes patient with end stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis. Okay, so this is a inpatient consult. You are consulted for blood sugar management of a 33-year-old man who has type 1 diabetes and end-stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis. And this is a patient seen on the inpatient service with Dr. Hamadi. So for his type 1 diabetes, he was diagnosed at age 6. He follows with an outside endocrinologist at Chapel Hill. His A1C, when last checked two weeks ago, was 6.6%. He has many complications, including end-stage renal disease. He's been on PD since June of 2020. He has proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and he had uh, both eyes photocoagulation treatments. Uh, he has neuropathy and peripheral arterial disease with ischemic bilateral lower extremity wounds. In fact, it's complicated by a critical limb ischemia requiring a right BKA just about a month and a half ago, also with some digital ischemia. He does not have hypoglycemia unawareness. And as an outpatient, he used to be managed by MDI, but he has been on a Medtronic 770G pump since May of 2020. And for the most part, he's in auto mode with a Guardian CGM. And I include his settings here, but we're actually going to get into these more in a moment. So I'll, I'll pass over that at this time. But I will note that because of his peritoneal, peritoneal dialysis, he does bolus himself based on the dextrose and the dialysis. And his mom says prior to being in the hospital, he had a really good time and range at 85%. So just to get caught up on his hospitalization, he had presented at the start of the month from a rehab facility with altered mental status, hyperglycemia, and hypotension. He was found to have DKA in the setting of an infusion site issue, as well as refusing boluses of insulin. Uh, he initially was treated in the ICU on an insulin drip, and there were some issues getting supplies, but he is now back on his pump by the time you're seeing him this time around. Uh, they also worked up for other causes of DKA. There was no other etiology found. Infectious workup was negative. But now he's still in the hospital awaiting a gastroparesis workup, and the team wants your help uh, managing his pump for the re remainder of his admission, which is about three to five days based on the discharge planning. From his history, I'll keep this quick. Uh, he also has high blood pressure, peripheral vascular disease with recurrent osteomyelitis, DVT, recurrent C. diff, major depression, migraines, and vertigo. And in addition to his right BKA, he also uh, fractured his left ankle and had open repair with hardware placed uh, a year and a half ago and tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. No one else in his family has diabetes, both his parents have hypertension and hyperlipidemia. He's coming from rehab, but otherwise he was living at home with his parents. He is not married, does not have any children, and is not employed. He never smoked or vaped and does not use alcohol or illicit drugs. These are his medications. So you can see he's on insulin, aspirate for his pump, simvastatin and aspirin, sertraline, melatonin, and olanzapine. And then for his gastroparesis during this admission, they have him on famotidine, senna, and metoclopramide. He also has Tylenol as needed, but he is not taking this regularly, has not taken it recently, as it is something that could interfere with the CGM. From his physical exam, blood pressure is 139 over 65. His pulse is in the 90s. His BMI is 26. He's overall well-appearing Caucasian male, though he is somewhat flat and withdrawn in his affect. Um, he does not have any thyromegaly. His heart is a regular rate and rhythm. His lungs are clear and his abdomen is soft. Um, he does have a right BKA and there are some lesions present on his distal extremities. 
and several of his fingers do appear dusky. He notes he's running out of places to check his finger stick blood glucose because uh, many of his fingers are dusky. So here are his current settings for his pumps. So this is what we're being consulted for is to help manage this for this patient. So as I mentioned, he's got a 770G. He's in auto mode with a Guardian CGM. His manual basal rate is set to 0.67, which comes out to about 16 units a day. His carb ratio ranges anywhere from 1 to 14 to 1 to 16, depending on the time of the day. Sensitivity is 52 and active time is three hours. He is instructed to bolus for his peritoneal dialysis bags overnight. So whenever they uh, use a bag that's 2.5% dextrose, he's instructed to bolus a 50 gram carb equivalent. And whenever he gets a 1.5 uh, dialysis bag, he does 30 gram carb equivalent. And these generally hang anywhere between 10 p.m. and 1 in the morning, and there's generally two or three in sequence. So he isn't always very reliable about uh, being awake to bolus himself for this and then uh, motivated to bolus him himself multiple times overnight to do this. Though he says at home he has no issues because he's the one, you know, hanging these bags at his convenience. It's here in the hospital where he's having some struggles. So at this time, looking at the last day, his point of care blood glucoses have ranged anywhere from 85 to 270. And he's telling us that he has episodes where he feels like he could have hypoglycemia, but this is all self-reported because we don't have any documentation of this. His finger stick glucose isn't consistently being done during these episodes, and when it has been done, it does not show us hypoglycemia. But also we're seeing that upper end of the range, 270, he's having frequent hyperglycemia, especially when he forgets to bolus for his peritoneal dialysis. In general, um, he doesn't have an overall trend, but it seems like the lowest tends to be in the mid-afternoon and the highest tends to be early in the morning, if not throughout the entire day. So we did not feel like this was enough information uh, to be able to make changes to his pump settings. So we decided to get the report from his pump. So this is a 14 day report, but with his hospitalization, he's only been wearing it for the last six days. And before I point out the highlights of this report, um, I think we're gonna have our panelists comment on, um, on what we're seeing here. Uh, Dr. Hamari, if you're on, can you please tell us your initial impression uh, as you saw this download for the patient? You will have to unmute yourself. Good morning. Um, you know, uh, patients with uh, peritoneal dialysis and in dialysis in general uh, have uh, more difficulty with the glycemic control, more sensitive, more fluctuation of uh, um, uh, glucose levels. Uh, for uh, hemodialysis, they, they get uh, to be more sensitive after dialysis, more resistance before dialysis. And with the peritoneal dialysis, it is more hemodynamically friendly but uh, then the glucose load with the uh, uh, bags. And we do have a lot of concerns or at least theoretical concerns about insulin pump in the hospital, not to mention the use of CGM in the hospital, et cetera. And, um, you know, sometimes concerns are legitimate. Sometimes it is over caution. And that's what we are using the case in here. But um, uh, in for sure, uh, is knowing what the patient is exactly doing, looking to the insulin pump setting, um, risk for hypoglycemia are the main things uh, uh, to look at. And, uh, you know, a patient uh, uh, that uh, ensuring calibration of the uh, insulin pump um, uh, with the sensor more correctly, uh, that would be an important thing that we wanted to know uh, how often that's happening, how often the patient is actually in auto mode how much of the basal. Something to, uh, to be aware of is uh, how much the basal rate manually is and how, uh, how much is actually delivered. Um, uh, that would be both for the risk of hypo and hyperglycemia. Uh, so, uh, so that's one of the things that we wanted to know ahead of time of making any changes. Uh, otherwise, it, uh, you know, it is essential with those pumps to see what the report says. Thank you, Dr. Hamadi. I think one of the biggest things that is uh, that Dr. Hamadi rightly said was the hypoglycemia. 
And I think it's very important to see in this report that even though the patient is reporting, I don't see any hypoglycemia in this download. But that is one of the biggest things we all worry about in patients, whether it is outpatient or inpatient, but very importantly, inpatient, we worry about the hypoglycemia because we don't want these patients to have their comorbidities exacerbated possibly because of the hypoglycemia. Thank you, Dr. Mahdi, for pointing that out. One thing I just want to add real quickly yeah. is that, so it looks like, you know, the mean glucose is definitely running higher overnight, mm -hmm. but it also does look like there's a lot of variability because that light blue line does get closer to 70. You're right, there is no hypoglycemia, but um, it gets a little closer to 70. So that's kind of interesting. It just looks like there's, yeah, there you go. There's more variability at, at those times. Yeah. And we could point to, to a little uh, uh, more to that as Michelle pros, uh, progressed in her presentation. So, uh, uh, so let's uh, see the next slide. Uh. Yeah, so I, I was just going to point out here, like Dr. Hamani and Diana are saying, his overall trend is not as bad as we were thinking, perhaps from his point of cares, uh, because he's not having hypoglycemia, and his hyperglycemia is not as bad as it could be, because he's rarely over 300, which is... Know, pretty good for someone on PD. And I saw there was a question how many cycles he gets. So anywhere from two to three bags are cycled each night uh, based on the nephrology services console. So here I wanted to give us another opportunity to comment um, just on this, the second half of this report zoomed in. Uh, any thoughts from the panelists before we move forward? Well, definitely looking at the basal amount, Dr. Amadi kind of pointed this out, but only getting 5.6 units per day, which is much lower than that preset rate of 0.675. Also, it looks like a bunch of exits or three of the exits were for auto mode max delivery. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting to know, because if that happens, then it's going to default to the manual settings, which are much higher. So those are a couple of things that I just noticed off the bat. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So just going through the report, so uh, the time and range, so only 54 or 56%, but the rest of it are all highs. As uh, Diana pointed out, the auto mode exits are most often for max delivery or for sensor updating. Uh, the statistics are a little bit skewed because he's only been wearing for six days. We'll see in a moment, the auto mode is closer to 85% of the time, uh, which we'll see on the next page. Average blood sugar was higher at 180 with a high standard deviation of 66. He's checking his blood sugars 3.4 times a day and calibrating 1.8 times on average a day, which is you know less than we would like. We'd like him to calibrate three or four times a day. And then as we've kind of mentioned now, his bolus, or excuse me, his basal rate, he's getting only uh, 5.6 units of basal when he's in auto mode, but the manual settings have him at 16 units a day in basal, um, in, in manual mode. So that's very discrepant and it puts him at obviously very high risk of hypoglycemia when he's in his manual mode. Overall, he's only getting about 19 units each day and 70% of which are boluses um, from meals and from his peritoneal dialysis. I think the important thing to find out as carbs entered, there's a huge variation in the carbs that he's entering for the day. 125 grams plus minus 151 grams. So this is a very wide variation in the amount of carbs he's taking in a day. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. Yeah, it, uh, one thing to note, a lot of those carbs in the bags of um, uh, peritoneal dialysis, and his bags um, uh, are quite variable from one day to another. And that's, that's something also to note about the use of this type of insulin pump, which usually learn from the past week of habits. And the word habits in this case does not exist because of the variation of food intake uh, with the gastrointestinal issues assumingly gastroparesis, and then um, the variation in the peritoneal dialysis bag. So really, if there is a challenge for the patient and the insulin pump would be the, that's the, uh, the max of the challenge. I think that that's a very important thing to think about is that is the closed loop a good option for somebody who's um, where the pump is going to have difficulty learning from the mm -hmm. previous patterns of meal or carb intake or uh, that are entered. So going through some more of the weekly reviews. So this is actually the second page because the first one, um, as I mentioned, he's only been wearing his pump for the past six days. So the first page is empty. This is really all the information we have. 
So the black tracing shows us the CGM readings, and the pink dots are either pointing care glucoses or blood glucoses. And filled in uh, pink dots along the tracing are those that are used for calibrations. The emptied are other readings. And as we can see, these points overlap pretty well, actually, with the CGM tracing. There's some, um, there's a little bit of variability here, but it's not uh, too bad. Along the bottom here, the pinks are our basal rates. So the auto basal rate maxes at 0.6, uh, which is interesting. It's set you know, pretty low at that max. But anytime he leaves uh, auto mode, which is marked with the black bars across the top, um, his basal rate resets to that 0.67, that manual mode, which is marked by that pink line across the top. It, it doesn't fluctuate. As you can see, there are many times where his auto basal rate is actually shut off um, to protect him from hypoglycemia. So the auto mode is really doing a great deal to his basal rates. Um, and, and so that's helping to prevent his hypoglycemia, but also helping to compensate when he doesn't bolus himself. So the boluses we can see here in purple and orange, I know they're really hard to read, but those are the times where he's entering his carbs. Um, I will move forward here as to what we recommended for this patient. So based on this report, we were able to make educated recommendations. The first thing is we needed to address that basal rate. So he had 16 that was programmed and five is what was actually being given. Um, and our concern is every time he was leaving his auto mode, he had the risk of hypoglycemia. And um, if we had him on manual mode, he would have actually uh, been at a big risk of hypoglycemia. So it was really important we were able to see his pump report to be able to you know, identify this issue. So we did decrease his manual basal rate. Secondly, we wanted to decrease the bolus amounts um, by increasing his carb ratio, just to try to balance out some of the basal and the bolus amounts. But he did decline this intervention because he's very hesitant to allow us to make changes. He felt that the pump worked really well for him until being hospitalized. And we're a temporary inpatient provider. We've been managing, we have not managed his pump before now. And ultimately, we won't be managing this in the long term. So it definitely helps to gain his trust, uh, some of his trust, by downloading this report and including him in the process of interpreting and discussing this. So I just did want to point out that this can be challenging if patients are really set on their pump settings um, at home and we're kind of temporary providers trying to uh, give some advice. So he did not uh, make our carb ratio changes that we had recommended. The next is we you know, talked about he really needs to cover his peritoneal dialysis more consistently. And so one of the things we looked into was the option of doing like a square wave bolus, something that's more extended so he could cover multiple peritoneal dialysis bags in one night. However, we discovered that this was not an option in Medtronic's auto mode. And, you know, maybe if we have some time later, we could talk about other kinds of um, closed loop pump systems, like control IQ that maybe could have been helpful for a patient like this. And finally, I saved my main point for last here. We really cautioned him against over relying on the CGM in auto mode, given the fact that he has CKD. And I really want to explore that topic more for you now and some of the data that we have on this. And additionally, our hospital policy doesn't truthfully support patients using auto or relying on the CGM while inpatient because these are not approved for inpatient use. Um, yet we still have patients who feel very strongly about using these things um, in the hospital. And so that can be an issue as well. But let's talk about the challenge of CKD um, and blood sugar management. I think I'm going to stop you here for a bit and ask Diana about her practical experience with patients with CKD and uh, type 1 diabetes and the labile blood sugar that you see. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, you're right with the sensor. Um, there's more fluid shifts in patients that are on dialysis. So it becomes all the more important to confirm with more finger sticks, um, making sure, you know, doing the optimal number of calibrations with this pump, which is three to four. And definitely on the inpatient side, yeah, everything needs to be confirmed because if that's not accurate, the auto mode is not going to work properly. Um, it's a real challenge with dialysis. It sounds like this patient actually kind of mastered, if he was able to get 85% time in range, 
he figured out kind of the right combination of bolusing with peritoneal dialysis, but it is really, really challenging. Many times with these types of pumps, we find that we have to actually go out of auto mode and do the manual settings. And then that way you can do things like square weight boluses. You can do temporary basils, which often work really well. Um, but this specific type of pump is really, really challenging. Um, so I'm actually super impressed that he was able to be able to do that. Um, and then I do find the placement of the sensor really can affect the accuracy. So someone having peritoneal dialysis, even though the abdomen is an FDA approved indication, normally I would not really use the abdomen. I, I think it, there's, it's more likely to be less accurate. So preferring the arm and even considering other off-label sites like the upper buttocks, the legs, um, and making sure you have the most accurate you know, readings as possible. So those are just some things. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. I will point out he wears his on the back of his arm. That's good. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you mentioned that the 770G is challenging. Have you seen better experience with the T-Slim? Yes. So one of the things with the T-Slim that's different from 770G is it works off of the existing settings. Mm -hmm. So you could set a higher basal rate during the time of peritoneal dialysis or alternatively, you could have a separate basal profile that he could switch to, and then that would kind of ramp up the insulin during that time. And also, you can do the extended boluses up to two hours. So it does offer a little more kind of flexibility with being able to dose. Thank you. In terms of uh, sensor use in peritoneal dialysis, the Guardian sensors to be a little bit more trusted sensor uh, uh, if we if we have to say, um, at least according to the literature, uh, I couldn't see um, uh, some literature reported FDA approval for, to be used in dialysis, but I couldn't see on the Medtronic website any uh, FDA approval for in this setting. Um, it, uh, but uh, there has been uh, some, I saw a study in type 2 diabetes on dialysis and some case report on peritoneal dial, uh, on dialysis, and Michelle is going to share some of that. Um, but uh, the Dexcom and uh, sensors that gets to be uh, still not adequately evaluated in this population, and I think they do have FDA application for uh, a newer one that might uh, fit the bill. Um, um, Michelle? Thank you, Dr. Mari. We have a comment from Dr. Lansing. Uh, Michelle, are you going through uh, the hospital policies or if not, if I could just have a minute to update people? Sure, I am not going to go through the hospital. Okay, so <clears throat> just to clarify, it's not that we're not supportive of it, except that the FDA, again, has not declared anything to be quote unquote approved. It's just that during the pandemic, the FDA has just not uh, placed any objections on the use of sensors in the hospital. And even if you look at the fine print of the Guardian, it would state there that treatment decisions were not meant to be done on the CGM alone, but rather as to when to do a finger stick there. Having said that, Dexcom was just granted a breakthrough device designation by the FDA in March. It doesn't mean it's approved, but it means that maybe the research on this will be sped up and the usual conversation by the bedside for people listening, especially maybe for internal medicine or even our own faculty in endocrinology, is that the offer is to take them off of their continuous uh, of their closed loop system uh, and have the manual uh, take over. And if they would prefer to still use the CGM, it's the CGM that's the issue, is to uh, have that bedside documentation and also have the finger six checked, at least as was already discussed by the panelists a while ago. So I wanted to clarify that from the point of view. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, that's one thing that I would like to comment about, because really, if we were to put the patient on auto mode and the trusted that setting um, that were done, and, you know, that's something yeah, about we don't know about the outpatient follow up uh, prior to coming in um, about the uh, pump download and adjusting the manual um, setting. If we were to trust the manual setting and put the patient on them, he would have been really in big trouble. Yes, thank uh, you. Yes, that's also a policy of ours to download the um, readings. It's a little bit more of a challenge 
with the teeth and connect because we don't have the software uh, on the laptop. At the same time, it, again, with the teeth and uh, tandem, it's better because it got, just gives bursts off of your of your uh, already inputted setting. But our nurse practitioners especially are very adept at downloading. The nursing policy also states that you need to know what the uh, insulin dose the patient would have had, and that's why they upload the readings on the chart. Thanks. Thank you. Great. So I just wanted to circle back to why CKD is so uh, challenging in the case of diabetes. So patients with advanced CKD typically have more late bile blood sugars. There's decreased insulin clearance and secretion, increased resistance. And in fact, your insulin resistance just can fluctuate a great deal depending on how uh, soon after dialysis it is. So with patients on hemodialysis, they have increased uh, insulin sensitivity following dialysis sessions, and that can, you know, wane leading up to their next dialysis session. So that can be a, a, a tricky feature. It's also altered gluconeogenesis, and obviously glucose loads are very common in peritoneal dialysis. So dialysis does lead to fluid shifts, as Diana mentioned, between the interstitial and intravascular space. And um, obviously, CGMs sit in this interstitial space and are trying to predict blood sugar based on this. And CGMs also rely on an enzymatic reaction, which can be, uh, in theory, affected by these fluid shifts, uremia and acidosis, as well as volume overload, all of which are um, at, a patient is at higher risk of developing if they have a C, uh, advanced CKD. So all of this is to say that we really need a lot more data on CGM and closed loop in the CKD population. But let me tell you what um, some of the data I could find uh, was. So my first question with CGM use specifically in end-stage renal disease on dialysis was how well does CGM estimate blood sugar in end-stage renal uh, dialysis? It is it adequate. Um, so despite some of these theoretical concerns I just mentioned, it appears that the answer is yes, it is some from what we have adequate. There was a, a meta-analysis that was performed that compared CGM readings with other glucose indicators in end-stage renal disease, and it showed that there was a good correlation between the CGM glucose readings and the finger stick readings. The R value uh, averaged out at 0.8. Um, others have a um, range in that R value as high as 0.97, which is very encouraging that it, cap uh, it correlates well with capillary blood glucose. But again, many studies are still ongoing to address this question, including there's one at the University of Virginia with Dr. Stump right now. So as far as I can tell at this time, Freestyle Libre and Dexcom CGMs are approved for CKD, but not end-stage renal disease on dialysis. And Medtronic and Eversense have CGMs uh, which are approved for patients with end-stage renal disease on dialysis. I'll just add, Eversense actually has an interaction with the uh, peritoneal dialysis mm -hmm. because of what's in it, the sorbitol, so that would cause it to be falsely elevated for peritoneal dialysis. Right, so that's another distinction is that hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis are not exactly the same, so thank you for pointing that out, that Eversense is not for peritoneal dialysis. So my second question was, if these are, you know, adequately close blood sugar readings from a CGM, does having a CGM improve glycemic control in end-stage renal disease? And it appears like the answer to this is also likely yes, though, as you'll see, our studies are small. Dialy Diab uh, had 15 patients on chronic dia uh, dialysis. It showed that they had much better glucose control. The mean glucose went from 150 to 140 when they were on CGM, and hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia were less frequent. And another study of uh, 28 patients, three months of CGM use, and this is not with like a closed pump system, this is just having the CGM on and running, led to an average A1C drop from 8.4 to 7.6, and the CGM glucose went from 178 to 160 um, without an increase in hypoglycemia. But again, these are very small studies, and these were done some time ago, back in 2015. And so we have better pumps now in, in uh, better CGM technology. So this is always improving. And there's an ongoing study right now at Emory with Dr. Galindo. So let's talk about specifically the question of CGM with closed loop in CKD. So again, this is a very small study. There were 17 patients um, who had type 2 diabetes on hemodialysis. And in the hospital, they used a fully closed loop pump versus conventional therapy for up to a hospitalization of 15 days. Um, they showed that the time and range um, between 180 or 100 and 180 increased by 37 uh, percent when patients were on the fully closed loop pump versus conventional therapy, and it did not add any hypoglycemia in the study. And you can see this is the uh, 
visual abstract from this particular paper. There's another study of 26 outpatients who had type 2 diabetes on dialysis, and they had 20 days of fully closed loop versus standard therapy. Um, and when they were on standard, they had a masked CGM. And it showed that their time and range increased from 37 to 52 percent. And the mean glucose level was 27 lower with fewer episodes of hypoglycemia. But truthfully, if this is the data we have, we need long term larger studies here. And these are also with hemodialysis patients. So the peritoneal dialysis side of things, we found a case report. Um, it was just published last month about a patient who is similar to our own type 1 diabetes, and safe renal disease, and peritoneal dialysis. He was arguably a bit more fragile than our particular patient because he was 77 years old, but he was managed on a mini med 670G with a guardian on auto mode 90% of the time. They followed him for a year. They showed he had time and range 74%, A1C 7%, and he did not have any significant episodes of hyper or hypoglycemia. So that case in conjunction with our own suggests perhaps that hybrid closed loop could be safe and feasible for patients with end-stage renal disease on peritoneal dialysis and type 1 diabetes, but really we need more studies, we need more data in this population. I think that's really the bottom line is that this is an active area of investigation. So just to summarize, this was a 33-year-old man with longstanding type 1 diabetes, multiple complications, and stage renal disease and peritoneal dialysis. And he was maintaining really good control uh, with his hybrid closed loop pump, which was a Medtronic 770G in auto mode by a guardian CGM. But really, we need more evidence for use on CGM and looping in advanced CKD. And I think with our last minute here, I would just open it back up to see if there are any comments. Um, thank you, Michelle. That was a great presentation and uh, lots of knowledge for our audience. I think we have Dr. Pantalone asking about the 780G that's coming in and any thoughts about uh, will it overcome the limitations of not being able to adjust the basal rates? And does a new system have a sensor that does not require OCD calibration? I can take that. So yeah, I think the 780G is going to definitely be superior to what we see here. It has auto corrections every five minutes, so it will be more aggressive essentially with that background insulin. Also now, so it, it's available in Europe, several outside US countries. And the Guardian 4, um, which does not require calibrations, is anticipated to be approved with that. So yeah, I think that's going to be very exciting. Um, now, I think based on being a dialysis, though, patients should still confirm and may want to do optional calibrations. But yeah, that's anticipated. And then it's also interesting just thinking Omnipod 5 recently was FDA approved, and we have no idea how that will work with the dialysis, but that it'll be interesting to see that, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists and thank you, Dr. Lundholm, for uh, a very exciting and informative case presentation. Um, we now have a great speaker, Dr. Robert Gavi. Dr. Gavi, would you like to uh, load your presentation? Welcome. <laughs>